Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Uh, <clears throat> Ambassador, there have been reports of atrocities by all sides of the conflict in South Sudan with at least several mass graves discovered and reports of both Dinka and newer civilians being murdered for belonging to the wrong ethnic group. I was especially saddened and disturbed by a December Human Rights Watch report that members of the South Sudanese Army had targeted newer civilians in Juba on the basis of their ethnicity. Given the fact that hundreds of millions of dollars in security assistance that the United States has provided to the South Sudanese forces since 2005, this raises some disturbing questions. Uh, the United States has now suspended security assistance and training in December. My question is, under what circumstances will this security assistance be allowed to resume, and will there be consideration now paid that, to the fact that we need assurances that our assistance and training will not be used to commit human rights violations? Thank you for that question. Uh, we uh, have been really saddened by uh, the events that uh, have clearly turned this fight into a battle uh, that uh, is ethnic in nature, and particularly uh, that it's happening inside of, uh, of the military. Uh, we, uh, the, we have asked the UN uh, about the information on mass graves. They have not been able to confirm those. Uh, we hope to help them get their human rights uh, <clears throat> Uh, monitors out in the field so that we can collect that kind of evidence and be prepared to uh, deal with the uh, with the evidence in in terms of holding people accountable. Uh, but we've not seen yet the the evidence of uh, of the mass graves. We do know uh, that there have been uh, extraordinary killings, uh, both uh, of Dinkas uh, in in the north and of New Air in and around Juba. And this is something that uh, uh, has all of us very worried. Our security assistance, uh, I think, uh, raises some serious questions on how we will implement uh, programs that uh, provide training uh, to the Sudanese military uh, after some of these actions uh, uh, have been made public. So, so here's my question to you. In, in January of 2012, President Obama added South Sudan to the list of countries eligible to buy weapons from the United States. Uh, during fiscal year 2012, the State Department reported that it had authorized commercial sales of $9 million worth of U.S.-made military equipment mm -hmm. to South Sudan, including military electronics and missile-related technology. More than $3 million worth of equipment was actually shipped. <clears throat> In contrast, the European Union continued to maintain an arms embargo since uh, July of 2011. The question is, will the State Department suspend or limit future weapons sales to South Sudan given the risk of U.S. weapons being used to commit atrocities? Uh, at, at the moment, we're not uh, implementing any of those programs, but let me get back to you with a full answer to that. My inclination is to say that that uh, is likely going to be the case, uh, but I'd prefer to get back to you with uh, more detail. Well, you know, the administration in general is in the process in general is in the process of loosening the regulations that govern arms exports under the new rules. Most types of weapons and equipment could be exported without a license and without a legal requirement that the State Department first review the proposed sales to ensure that they will not fuel armed conflict or harm human rights. The press has reported at one point the administration was seriously considering loosening the controls on guns and ammunition mm -hmm. since they were not critical to maintaining a, a military or intelligence advantage of the United States. Um, can you give us your opinion, Madam Ambassador, uh, whether or not we do need a very careful review of arms exports in general to assess the potential for them to be used to commit human rights violation that is critical to protecting civilians both in South Sudan but in other countries in the world? I, I can speak on South Sudan and I certainly uh, will uh, take your question back but my view is in South Sudan we are suspending right now the implementation of all of those programs and we will be looking very closely at uh, any kinds of support that we provide the South Sudan military in the future. For my part, I think the European Union is 
closer to where we should be on these issues. I think the United States has to step back um, because the long-term implication of anything that we do can be profound. If we start selling nuclear power plants to countries that have long-term instability issues, uh, or we sell arms to countries uh, that we know have a much higher probability than not of being turned around and used for purposes other than those which were originally intended, um, then we have the responsibility of uh, reevaluating whether or not it makes any sense going forward. And finally, um, the overwhelming majority of the South Sudanese people depend on natural resources for their <coughs> livelihoods. Temperatures have increased, rainfall has decreased in the area over the last several decades with negative consequences for agriculture and food security. Uh, we know that that then creates a threat multiplier uh, inside of countries like Sudan. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, that in, in your opinion, as to what we can do can as a country to help to reduce the uh, long-term impact of climate change on a country like Sudan? Yeah, Senator, thank you for that question. We have actually, for the last two years, had an intensive initiative in East Africa um, on building greater resilience, sp specifically in areas that are um, have chronic poverty overlaid with these continual shocks of droughts and floods and the changes that you're identifying. We've made great progress in Kenya and Ethiopia and even Somalia, and we were moving forward in South Sudan. What we're seeing is the disruption of all of that, which is all too often the case when you have conflict that rolls back progress and gains. Hopefully we'll be able to resume that, which enables uh, greater management of risk and greater adaptation uh, to these kinds of changes so that we get ahead of the kind of natural disaster yeah. cycles. So you, you get into a very bad uh, negative feedback loop where the very thing that caused the problem, the instability, the food insecurity, fighting for uh, smaller, smaller and smaller amounts of natural resources uh, then lead to the conflict that then makes it more difficult for you to solve the problem that was the, that, an original cause of the problem. Huh? That's absolutely right. Con understanding how to manage and mitigate the risk of conflict is critical for these programs. We've done a lot of that work at the community level um, throughout South Sudan, and I would just note that we are not getting widespread reports of uh, violence among communities. So far, it's armed actors mm -hmm. who are perpetrating most of the violence. And we want to continue to be able to do that and would love to come brief you on the resilience programs. It, the, the only problem is, as we know, is that the absence of the natural resources that are related to climate change then further exacerbate the ethnic conflict. They're fighting over less and less, which makes it easier for the arms forces to enlist their ethnic brethren in a fight over those limited resources. Okay, so the climate change at the end comes back as a major factor. And again, I would just urge that human rights be a factor that is much higher in priority in terms of arms exports from the United States. I think, you know, it's just time for us to have that reevaluation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.